following information that I'm going to present is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment from your regular physician. Now, if you're concerned about your health, you should meet with your personal physician to discuss your concerns. Equally, I'm not able to answer any personal questions about anyone's health on this platform. So I'm going to go straight into the presentation now. I'm sure most of you know this really lovely um, man. Oh, yes. On the 16th of August, 1977, Elvis Presley was found dead, slumped by the toilet in his mansion called Graceland in Memphis, Tennessee. The doctor said that he died of a heart attack. He was only 42 years old. Okay. However, a post-mortem revealed that Elvis had liver damage. He weighed 25 stones. He had 10 times the amount of codeine normally recommended for medical purposes in his body, as well as other prescribed drugs, including laxatives. His colon was five to six centimeters long. So it's about that um, five to six centimeters in diameter. So it's about that whereas normal should be half that amount, two to three. And instead of being the standard four to five feet in length, his colon was um, eight to nine feet in length. He had copious amounts of a natural white chalk-like fecal matter in his colon. He was, as we would say in nursing, he was impacted with feces. The postmortem also revealed that the feces had been in his colon for four to five months and would have certainly presented a tremendous toxic load on the singer's physiology. One, one of the doctors claims that Elvis's bloated appearance and obesity were due to his constipation and not from overeating the wrong foods. Apparently, the doctor claims that he was in talk with Elvis's surgeon about literally removing some of the colon where, where it was full of poo. He had heart disease due to his lifestyle, but the action that eventually triggered his untimely demise was straining very hard to have a, a bowel movement. Poor Elvis died of a classic case of heart attack induced by strain into poo. He died from constipation. So question, what is constipation? Now, as we've just heard from Elvis Presley, constipation can lead to serious illness and death. But how do you know you are constipated? You know, some old medical textbooks say, you know, you can have feces and not in your bowels for up to a year and it's not a problem. However, it's likely to be constipated if you have not had a bowel movement at least three times during the last week. Um, it's likely to be constipation if the feces is often large and dry, hard or lumpy, like rabbit droppings. And if it's constipation, if you have to strain to have a poo or in pain when you're having a poo, you may also have stomach ache and feel bloated or sick in, or if you're having frequent stools. Sometimes you may have a bowel movement, but you still feel that, you know what? I haven't emptied my bowels properly. So let's look at what are the symptoms. So the symptoms of constipation can be easily overlooked, especially if someone has learning difficulties or if someone has dementia. So some of the things that you can experience is abdominal pain, cramps, bloating, loss of appetite. You may feel nauseous, you may even vomit. You may have overflow of diarrhea, so you may have having very liquidy stools coming out your back passage. Um, there may be fecal impaction, or you may even, and this is a horrible thing to witness. I, I, I remember when I was a student nurse in, on the wards, my very first ward, seeing that, you know, someone vomiting, feces. The smell is horrendous. 
but the fear on people's face when they're vomiting it, they know something is seriously wrong. So fecal vomiting is not very pleasant. And also, because the body is trying to get rid of this um, waste, the, the, the bowels can twist on itself and lead to ischemia. That where, that's when no blood supplies get to the colon and it dies, and blood poisoning, septicemia. So you may ask, how often should I pass stools? Um, surprisingly, it's only recently that science has come to some agreement as to what is normal. So if, as I said, if you look at standard physiology textbooks, they imply that normal can be from one bowel movement to every few weeks or months or to 24 times a day can be regarded as normal. Can you imagine going once every few months? Wow. Now it wasn't until 2010 when we got the first serious look at defining normal stool frequency. And they said it should be between three per week or three per day based on the fact, they base that information on the fact that about 98% of people tend to fall in that category. However, you know, can you imagine going three times per week? Some people do, I, I understand that. But just because it's considered normal, it doesn't mean it's helpful or optimal. Um, so when they look at those 98% of people that fall between three a day or three a week, a large number of those people reported that they have urgency or they have to strain to go and they have incomplete defecation. That means not everything has come away. Um, so the researchers felt because 98% of people experience that, that must be normal. That is normal if you're eating a fiber deficient um, diet, but not normal for our species. Defecation, the ability to go to toilet should not be a painful exercise. So how often should I pass stools? According to Dr. Jensen and Dr. Kellogg, these were famous 20th century naturopaths. They spent decades of their professional careers saying that if you don't eliminate your waste daily and preferably two to three times a day, you are in danger of suffering from major degenerative diseases. Now, Dr. Jensen's in his book, um, Dr. Jensen's Guide to Better Bowel Care, he says that they, they, they've said that Health is stored in the colon. Health is stored in the colon. And consequently, if your colon is not healthy, then you're going to get disease. And they uh, maintain that disease begins in the, in the colon. So Dr. Jensen, in his book, says, I consider it the greatest present day internal danger to health. That is to talk about constipation. Intestinal toxemia and auto intoxication, that's when the waste is reabsorbed back into your body rather than being it's passed out, um, are direct results of intestinal con constipation. Constipation contributes to the lowering of the body's resistance, predisposing the, the body to many acute illnesses. And the, initi and the initiation of many degenerative and chronic processes. Constipation indirectly cripples and kills more people in our country, and he was talking about the United States of America, than almost any other single disease condition having to do with deficient function. So let's bring it Let's bring it to the UK, right? He mentioned America. Let's see about um, the UK. So most of our audience are in um, Britain. 
but you can be sure if you follow a Western lifestyle, you will be experiencing constipation. So who is affected? So constipation is far from an unusual problem. So one in seven adults in Britain are affected. One in three children are affected at any one time. 60% of those suffering co from constipation have been shown to be women. So a lot of women suffer from constipation. And also constipation is common during pregnancy. 74% of elderly nursing home residents use laxative for bowel regulation. So from these figures, we can conclude that this is a common health issue that is easily addressed by some lifestyle changes. So we've looked at those who are affected by it. Let's look at the cost of constipation. And again, I'm looking at the UK. Um, a conservative estimate is that there are around 6.5 million people in the UK today with some form of bowel problem. That's one in 10 of us. How many people are currently on the platform? All right, so if there's about 150, so there's, that's about 15 people on the platform. Is that right, if I've done my calculations? Yeah, have constipation, yeah. So, 168... Pardon? Plus those, on plus those on YouTube, there's about um, 30. Okay, all right then, yeah. So, so if there's about 20 or 200 people on this platform then, then there's about 20 people who are suffering from constipation. So we're looking at the cost of constipation. 168 million pounds was spent by the National Health Service in England alone. So we're not looking at Scotland and um, Northern Ireland or Wales on treating constipation in 2018 and 19. Um, Eight million, eight million pounds was spent on unplanned admissions due to to hospitals due to constipation so someone has bypassed their gp and have gone straight to the hospital usually through a and e and that's caused about eight eight million pounds and then about 87 million pounds in 2018-19 was spent on prescriptions for laxative medication in england and we're not looking at people who just buy some um, laxatives over the counter from the chemist or just going to Tesco's and buying some, something for their constipation. So it's a very, very costly um, problem. So we've looked at the numbers. We've looked at the final um, financial costs. Let's look at the human cost of constipation. Richard Hanley, this lovely young man, was 33 years old and he had Down syndrome. And he died at Ipswich Hospital on the 17th of November in 2012. Now, two days before his death, there was around 10 kilograms, that's 22 pounds of feces, stools removed from his body in an operation. That's over a stone and a half of feces removed from his body. He was admitted to hospital on the 14th of November, three days before he died, before he died, after his family became concerned with his distended abdomen, which made him look full term pregnant. He had operation to remove the fecal matter the following day. He was born with moderate learning difficulties, disabilities, and he had bowel problems, but the family were managing it with uh, laxatives and high fiber diet. However, he moved to a care home and which turned into a supported living complex. This resulted in changes to his diet and a reduction in monitoring his bowel movements leading to his constipation worsening and eventually his untimely death. 
So, what has the Bible, what has the Bible to say about a bowel disease? So, bowel issues and constipation is not a new phenomenon. Now, the Bible records in Jeremiah 4, it says, Jeremiah say, my bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. The Bible recognizes that there's a close link between the brain and the gut, the brain and the bowels. But one story I like to share is Jehoram. And I, when I was younger, I used to enjoy reading this because he had a gruesome death due to bowel issues. The Bible tells his story in 2 Chronicles 21. Now, he was 32 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. However, he was a wicked king because he married the wrong woman, unfortunately. He committed heinous crimes, mass murder, genocide. He worshipped idols and forced the country of Judah to do so. He was warned by God but refused to obey and he suffered the consequences of his actions and his lifestyle. So calamities came to him one after the another. And it says, and after all this, the Lord smote him in his barrels with an incurable disease. And it came to pass that in the process of time, after the end of two years, his bowels fell out by reason of his sickness. So it appeared that he had an intestinal prolapse so he died of sore diseases. He was 40 years old when he died, an extremely painful, offensive death. And it says he departed without being desired. So we're gonna look at what causes constipation. Um, this this quote is from Dr. Dennis Parsons Burkitt, and he's considered to be the doctor of fiber. And he did a lot of studies about constipation and stools. And what he found that societies that eat unrefined food, that is food in their natural state, produce large stools and build small hospitals. Societies that eat unrefined foods produce large stools and build small hospitals. Societies that eat fiber depleted foods produce small stools and build large hospitals. Yes, it's well known that chronic constipation creates conditions for the development of other conditions such as hemorrhoids when part of the rectum falls out anal fissures, where there's tears along the anus, anal fistulas, diverticulitis, rectal prolapse, cancer and other health problems. So let's have a quick look at what the colon does. Now, when we eat, food moves from the mouth to the esophagus to the stomach. The food then passes through the small intestines, which you can see on the screen, to the large intestine. So on the right side, you have the ascending colon. Along the top where it says colon, that's a transverse colon. Then you have the descending colon, and that little loop there is a sigmoid colon. Then you have the rectum and the anus. And so what happens, the food is moved, once it goes through the small intestine, the, the waste that, and the water that has remained goes into the large colon. The colon removes water, salts, and some nutrients, and it starts forming the stool. There's muscles in the colon that moves the feces along, squeezing its content along through a function called peristalsis. Also in our colon, we have billions of bacteria, health, billions and trillions, in fact, of healthy bacteria, which coat the colon and its contents. And it, they live in healthy balance with the body. And they live off the fiber that we eat. So as I mentioned, the colon is divided into those four parts, ascending, transverse, descending, and the sigmoid colon before the, the rectum. 
in a male adult, the colon is, is around um, five feet. That is one and a half meters. Okay. So, so how, so once the thesis goes through the colon, the question is, how do you know when to have a poo? So we're just gonna look at what's called a defecation reflex. Defecation reflex. So the process of eliminating stools from the body requires this, the work of the defecation reflex. When the stool is finally well formed, it gets pushed along, um, as I said, through a process of peristalsis down into the descending colon and then into the rectum. Now it's held there, it's held there until there is sufficient volume pressing along the, the, um, the walls of the rectum, which sends a signal to two rings of muscles, sphincter muscles. So you have the internal sphincter muscle just here, and then the external sphincter muscle, which is your, you can't see? Okay, you can't see it. Two sphincter muscles, rings of muscle, and they, they control, um, they hold the feces inside. Yeah. And then when enough um, poo fills up the, the rectum, it presses against the wall of the rectum and it also presses the it, internal sphincter muscles, which relaxes and sends a signal to your brain that it's time to relieve yourself. You get the urge and it's, it's, it's the call of nature. When that happens, the external sphincter, and you can feel the external sphincter. If you put your little finger and lubricate it, just put it up your bum, you can feel that muscle there, that ring of muscle. That external sphincter opens when you command it. Now, because this is voluntary, you can have the urge to defecate, but you can wait until it's convenient. Now, if you ignore the urge, what we say in the profession, reject the stool, water keeps being absorbed back into the body and the stool gets hard and dry. And sometimes the stool can even go back up into the rectum and the sigmoid. Now, some people are chronically constipated because they don't want to take the time to have a bowel movement or they're embarrassed to have a bowel movement at work or um, at school. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the causes of constipation, rejecting the stool. So well-formed stools tells us um, when it wants to come out. We don't need to coax it out. Yes? We don't need to coax poo out. It should just come out. It looks like a brown banana with a point at one end. It's well hydrated and it just slips out easily. So question, what should a well-formed stool looks like? All right. So ask yourself this question. So when you've had a poo, I don't know if any of you taken the time once you've had a poo to look, at, look um, in the toilet to see what it looks like. Yeah, yeah have you? All of us. All right. So one of the things you need to do is look at the consistency, the color, and the smell. And there's this, the Bristol st stool chart when we use it at, at Manor House. And they point that there's seven types of stools. The type one, it looks like rabbit droppings. And that's severe constipation. It means that there's been a longer transit time. Type two looks like a bunch of grapes. That's mouth constipation and you've got a bit of toxic overload. Um, type three, sausage shaped with cracks on the surface. People can describe it like corn on the cob. So the next time you look at a corn on the cob and about to eat it, think about the stools. Yes. So that's considered normal. Yeah. And then the next type, type four, 
is sausage or snake-like. It's smooth and soft. Again, that's a considered like a normal bowels movement. It's like a sausage type. type. Five, um, it's like chicken nuggets. May lack fiber. Uh, it suggests you may lack fiber. And it's the beginning of toxic overload in the system. Type six, fluffy pieces with ragged edges, mushy, mushy peas. So it looks like oat porridge. It uh, indicates you may have mild diarrhea. There may be inflammation in the body and it's a toxic overloaded system. And type seven is watery, no solid pieces at all. So it looks like gravy. And that's severe diarrhea, and it's indicating there's inflammation in the body, and it may also indicate that there's bacterial or viral infection. So the question is, next question we have, how often do you have a bowel movement? Now, people on good diets generally have one to three bowel movements a day. If you are not having a daily bowel movement, there can be issues. And the next question to ask all of you, and for you to consider, how long does it take for you to move? And by that, I'm talking about transit time. So let's do a quick test. And you can take this down, and it's something you can do at home. So we're trying to find out how long it takes from the time you eat food until it comes out the other end. So that's the transit time. Um, so what you can do to test that, you can buy some charcoal, charcoal tablets or powder, mix it, in, mix it in water and drink it. It's important that you note exactly when you took the charcoal. Write down the date and the time. Yes, write those down. And then you keep on observing your um, poo. When you see the dark charcoal calc come out in the toilet, you can calculate how many hours since you Four took days. the charcoal. That is your transit time. Um, you can also, if you can't get charcoal, you can also do the tests with beetroots. I believe um, Tesco's got beetroots in at the moment. Uh, I think uh, uh, Aldi also have beetroots. So go and buy some beetroots. You need to eat about three or four whole beetroots. Um, now let's, let's look at the times then. We're looking at transit times. So if it's less than 12 hours, so if you're going very frequently, that then it may suggest that you have malabsorption problems. Yeah. If it's, tw well, you're not absorbing your nutrients from your food. Malabsorption problem essentially means you're not absorbing the nutrients from the food that you're eating. If it's 12 to 24 hours from the time you've taken the beetroot or the charcoal to the time you see it come out the other end, then that's optimal. That's what we should be aiming for. If it's more than 24 hours, this indicates that waste is sitting inside your colon too long. And so if you've got a poor transit track time, it greatly, greatly increases the risk of colon disease. Substances that were supposed to be eliminated are being reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Now they can irritate um, and, it, excuse me, interfere with your body and how it's working. Now, when a person is constipated, if your transit time is more than 24 hours, the walls of the colon are often impacted or caked with accumulation of fecal waste matter. So the inner diameter of the colon, what we call the lumen, is reduced like a water pipe with a buildup of mineral deposits. Now, eventually, the opening becomes narrower and narrower, make it more and more difficult for your body to pass waste. Since the encrusted feces, which is lying in the colon wall, is unable, the colon is unable to absorb nutrients from your food. Waste from the blood, which should normally be drawn into the colon through the colon walls, are being reabsorbed by the body, along with 
other toxins resulting from the fermentation and putrefaction of incompletely digested food. So if you've got meat, it's rotting in inside the body because you have constipation and there's encrustation on the colon wall. If you're eating fruits and vegetables, those are fermenting in the body. And, and this, this can lead to a whole type of health problems. Sally Lewis. She was 55 years old from Bromsgrove, Bromsgrove in Worcester. She had learning difficulties. She died after feces blocked her bowels in 2017. Now her sister, Julie, said the condition was so bad, Sally had feces in her throat at the time of her death. Her family said that they wanted to make sure nothing like this happens again. On the evening of the 26th of October, 2017, Sally, who had long-standing history of constipation, she became unwell. The family thought she was coming down with a um, tummy bug. She was wobbly and unsteady on her feet. She refused to drink, which was unheard of for Sally. That night, Sally slept on the sofa. The next morning, she was dead. A post-mortem examination found her large bowel was grossly distended and the cause of death was recorded as large bowel obstruction due to fecal impaction. Her death was considered to be from natural causes. Okay, so we're going to look at the cause, causes and cures for constipation. I mentioned earlier, Dr. Dennis Burkett. Now in the 1970s, he and his colleagues went and studied traditional African tribes, the traditional African tribes in Uganda and South, um, um, South Africa, the Bantu tribe. And they found that unlike Western white, um, white indigenous children, African children could produce feces on demand. Can you imagine it? Someone says to you, could you go to the toilet, produce some feces? They will go off, squat down and produce poo on demand. So Dr. Dennis, uh, Dr. Burkett and his colleagues found that their stools were large, soft and were easy to pass. In fact, Dr. Burkett started to weigh the amount of feces passed, um, the amount of feces passed in a day. Right, hold on a moment. All right. So the diet. Now he found that white children in Africa who ate a Western diet produce five ounces of stools daily. That's about 150 grams. Whereas Africans eating traditional um, diet pass 16 ounces of stools. That's about one pound of poo daily. The Africans who ate um, the indigenous diet also had a shorter transit time as well. All right. So that's how the Western diet, five ounces. The traditional diet, 16 ounces. Yeah. So the transit time for the Western diet was 48 to 72 hours. That's up to three days. The traditional African diet was 12 hours. He also noted that people on native diets had low incidence of diseases common to Western civilizations, such as appendicitis, diabetes, diverticulitis, gallstones, coronary heart disease, hiatal hernia, varicose veins, hemorrhoids, colon cancer, and obesity. However, what they also noticed is when these people that the indigenous African people moved into the city and adopted the Western diet, they started to develop these diseases. 
So Dr. Burke attributed much of the disease to poor dietary fiber intake in a modernized diet. So since that time, much research has come across and they've said that what we need to be eating is a whole food plant-based diet, which will supply all the fiber required to reduce the risk of constipation. Now, Dr. Kellogg's, um, he, he said fiber, he, he recognized fiber is crucially important for the colon. Fiber acts like an internal brush for the colon. So we have soluble and insoluble fiber. Insoluble fiber goes more or less, go, more or less goes through the colon without being touched. But what it does, it adds bulk to the stools, making it easier to pass. Insoluble fiber acts like a soluble fiber acts like a sponge and also feeds the healthy bacteria in the colon. But so what we need, we need soluble and insoluble fiber. So Dr. Kellogg says that civilized man has adopted the dog's diet while having the colon of the chimpanzee. So what he's suggesting is that civilized man has replaced fruit and vegetable and grains, seeds and nuts with animal flesh. But we haven't got the makeup to cope with that high meat diet. So animal products, flesh, there is no fiber whatsoever. So if your diet consists of dead animals, then you'll be ripe for disease. Also dairy products like cheese and milk is constipating due to the lack of fiber, but also an enzyme called lactase to digest the milk protein can cause constipation because we don't have it when we um, past um, when we are weaned. Many young children suffer constipation due to subsisting on very high amounts of milk and dairy products. Now, if you're eating refined foods like white bread or hard dough bread, white rice, anything that has its bran removed, then expect to experience hard dough stools. Constipation bread, that's what I call white bread and hard dough bread. <laughs> Other habits that contribute to constip constipation are hasty eating, eating too, much, too fast, cut on swallow. I, I remember I did a colonic on a, a family member. And as we were looking at the waste that was coming out, I saw a whole piece of apple that still had a teeth mark in it coming out in the waist. It was clear this person was just cutting the food, biting it and swallowing it. They were not chewing the food. So if we're eating hastily and not chewing the food, that food is not going to be able to be digested well and act like that internal brush in the body. So you may be eating excellent um, plant-based diet, but it's important to also chew the food. Conversely, Dr. Kellogg's also claims that the habit of chewing too much can cause constipation. Mm -hmm. So we have to be temperate in all things, no extreme, not the cut and swallow, but also not the chewing too much. Mm -hmm. However, what I know from our, our society that we do not chew our food enough. We, we, I've never come across a person who chews their food too much. We also have to look at how we um, take our food. Hot foods and hot drinks, they too can cause constipation. Yeah. Also, if you're not eating enough food, if you're on a juice fast for too long, that too can cause constipation. Or if you're just drinking um, a water fast, uh, again, if you don't cleanse your bowels before you have go on a juice fast or a water fast, 
then that can cause constipation. All right, next one, lack of water. So lack of water is a major cause of constipation. So conversely, water is crucially important to prevent constipation. Rather than drinking water, we may find people drinking alcohol, um, tea, coffee, sweet drinks, and are not drinking the water. The body needs water. Those other drinks act as a diuretic and make you pass out the water through your kidneys rather than a lot of water going into the colons. So if we drink in a lot of um, alcohol, caffeine, sweet drinks, um, then it's going to make a bad situation of constipation even worse. So I've come across many people. Uh, I've said, how much are you drinking? They said, yes, I'm drinking water, but how much? And they tell me how much they're drinking. I say, well, you're not drinking enough water. So there's a simple water formula that you need to know how much you should drink for your health and body condition. If you're very, very sick, a very sick person, um, then you should be drinking about 37 mils for every kilogram of body weight. Now, most people should fall in the sick to healthy aspect um, group. And then you should be drinking 47 mils per each kilogram. And the maximum amount of water you should be drinking in any 24 hours is four liters. So if you're a very large person and you calculate that you should be drinking about five and a half liters, the top of the cutoff point is four liters. Now, if you're doing a lot of exercises where you're sweating a lot, or if you're in a very hot climate, you should be drinking about 50 mils for each kilogram of weight. But that's only during the time you're doing those exercises. So if you're in a very hot country, but in air-conditioned environment, then stick to 47 mils per kilogram of weight. And then added to that, if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, rich with fruits and vegetables in their natural state, you'll be also getting additional water from the foods. So, so these are the two things that um, cook, may cause constipation, but also is a cure for constipation. All right, I'm gonna quickly go through because I'm conscious of time. Okay, inactivity. Inactivity can lead to constipation. So imagine if someone is paralyzed, they're going to have a tendency to constipation. If they're paralyzed from the neck down or below the waist, they're going to have a tendency to constipation. Equally, if someone is inactive and they're sitting down all day, and if they're inactive, especially after a meal, they will have a tendency um, to constipation. So it's crucially important that people exercise and what the best exercise i always say is walking so why exercise exercise this is a quote written in 1890 a exercise aids the dyspeptic that someone's difficulty of digestion by giving the digestive organs a healthy tone but a short walk after a meal with a head erect and the shoulders back exercising moderately is a great benefit so it's important to exercise. All right, next thing we're gonna look at what causes and the cures for constipation. So a lot of medication um, creates constipations. So pain relievers, analgesic, morphine coding, slows down the digestion. Antacids, antispasmodic drugs, antidepressant drugs, tranquilizers, tranquilizers, iron supplements, all these different drugs cause constipation. And can you imagine it? Laxatives, the abuse of laxatives can cause constipation as well. So if we are, people are using laxatives continually when they're abused, um, especially for some people who use them to slim, to lose weight, it can actually cause your constipation to worse, worsen. So there are three main laxatives, the bulking agents, 
That's where you eat in a high fiber diet, psyllium husk, oats, and wheat bran. The osmotic laxatives, and that's to do with water. It draws water into the bowels. An example of that is like lateral, lactulose. And then there's a third type, the stimulant laxatives. And those ones really irritate the colon. Yes. And it makes the colon want to get this stuff out as quickly as possible. An example of that is castor oil and Epsom salts. Mm. Okay. Uh, and then the last one, the, the last causes and cures for constipation is the physical aspects is aging. Yes. Yeah. So people say, as you get older, you're more likely to be constipated. However, when we look at the elderly people, they're more likely to eat a low fiber diet and they tend to rely on packaged and prepared foods. They're often taking a series of medications which slow down their bowels. And also, as we, lose, as we get older, we lose the sense of thirst. Whereas young people, when they're thirsty, they go and have a drink of water. Older people lose their ability to, um, to know when they're thirsty. Other physical issues that may cause um, constipation is pregnancy, as I mentioned as well. I want to look at some of the psychological factors. Yeah. So there's some emotional and psychological factors that can cause constipation. Emily Titterton died on the 8th of February 2013 from a cardiac arrest caused by chronic constipation. She was 16 years old. Emily, who was homeschooled, had, had not been to the toilet for three months. An inquest into her death heard that the constipation was so bad that some of her internal organs had been moved out of their position, including her diaphragm. The, paramedic, the paramedics who came described their shock at Emily's grossly extended abdomen when she collapsed at home, and they said that she was vomiting feces. The coroner said that all this could have been prevented and concluded the cause of death was natural causes contributed by psychosocial factors. Um. So some of the psychosocial factors, I'll share, I'm sure I'm going to share a picture, share a picture with you. And this is, um, I'm going to tell a story of my son. When he was young, um, about 17, he was going to a college with, in Leicester. He lived with my um, parents and he refused to use the toilet at school, at, at the college he would reject the urge to go to toilet. Yes, he rejected that urge and he would wait until he would go home to have um, a, a poo. Eventually, over time, he became impacted with feces. And so when he came up, to, um, came up during the summertime to be with us, his parents, it came to light that he was impacted with feces and we had to do something to sort him out. Fortunately, we were able to do something to resolve that issue. However, psychological factors can interrupt the ability to go toilet. Now, another thing that can cause, can be a psychological factor is when people get put off by, from the food that they eat. There is a close relationship between the brain and the gut. And remember Pavlov's dogs, when the bell was rung, they start salivating, they, they produce gastric juices. And in the same way, the same things happen to us. You know, when we know that food is coming and we're anticipating that food, you know, we, our body starts producing gastric juices to help digest the food. 
However, if we have a monotonous and bland diet day after day after day, then we will not produce those gastric juices to digest the food and the food is not digested effectively and it starts putrefying, fermenting and become rancid inside the body and start forming, start making the body become constipated. So it's important that we eat our food with relish. Now, the next thing I wanted to look at is relish. We need to enjoy our foods, yeah, when we eat it. Um, to sit, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm trying to go quicker. So as many people ask me, what is the best position to have a poo in, to sit or to squat? Now, um, we've been to... My husband and I have been to China, Maylots, the public toilets. So they have these toilets that are on the floor and you have to squat over the, the toilet. And I remember the very first time I saw the toilet, I was thinking, do I do it forward? Do I go backwards? I just didn't know how to, to squat over the toilet. And also I had a skirt on and I was trying to hold this skirt up around my, my waist and, and, and also added to that, the Chinese are very open about movement. So the cubicles were very short and anyone could walk past and see you squatting on the toilet. You know, us in the Western world, we're very private um, about when we have our poo. We don't tell people, oh, I've just been for a poo, you know, and we're concerned about the smell and different things like that. So the question that we have, should we sit or should we squat? Which is the best way? Now, there's actually a kink right at the end of the rectum, almost a 90 degree angle that helps keep us from messing our pants when we're walking around. But that angle is only slightly, slightly straight, straightened out when we sit on a Western toilet. The maximal, the greatest straightening out of this angle occurs when we're in a squatting position. And that allows us to have a smoother bowel elimination. So if you're squatting, it helps the, um, the poo to just drop out easily, as you can see on the, the, um, on the slide. <laughs> The problem with sitting on a Western toilet is that it keeps the kink in your lower bowel and that forces you to work harder to push out the, um, the feces. Squatting relaxes your puborectalis muscle more and straightens out your colon, giving the um, stools a straight route out. As a result, you can go more easily with less straining. Now in 2003, a study was done of 28 healthy people to see how long it took them to pass stools, whether sitting on a standard toilet, sitting on a low toilet or squatting. They not only recorded how long it took them, but how much effort it took. Squatting, the study concluded, takes less time and less effort. Mm -hmm. But the question is asked, how many people can balance themselves on a standard toilet? Can you do that? I'll be frightened of slipping off and my foot going into the basin of the toilet. It's uncomfortable and dangerous. So what the researchers suggested that instead of doing that, squatting on the toilet, you lean forward as you sit and with your hands on or near the floor. So you're leaning forward on the toilet with your hands on the floor. They, they advise all sufferers from constipation to adopt this forward leaning position when pooing as the weight of your torso places extra pressure on your colon. But the question is, why not just treat the cause? You know, if you think about those African children who ate an indigenous diet, you know, yes, they squatted but they could poo on demand. They didn't have to exert any pressure. Um, instead of finding ways to add even more pressure, which like Elvis caused a heart attack caused by the Walsalva maneuver, why not get to the root of the problem? 
The fundamental cause of straining is the effort required to pass unnaturally firm stools. A cardiologist, Dr. Joel Kahn, said, You know you're eating a plant-based diet when you take longer to pee than to poo. You know you're eating a plant-based diet when you take longer to pee than to poo. So I'm coming towards the end. So what... What, so what essentially what they're saying is your poo should just drop out of you, just come out without any effort. So let's start looking at some of the right habits that we need to adopt in order to maintain a healthy bowel, healthy colon. We need to eat a whole food plant-based diet. I've been saying that throughout this whole pre um, presentation. We need to increase the amount of raw foods we need to be drinking water yes, um, and drink it according to our health and body weight. We need to be exercising regularly. We need to in, in put in place regularity in our lifestyle. Get up at the same time, have breakfast at the same time, drink your water during, during the day steadily throughout the day, have your lunch at the same time, go to bed at the same time in the evening and train your body to have a poo at the same time every day. We need to chew our food. We need to, as I mentioned, train our body to bowels, train our body to open our bowels. We also need to use oils, which are very healthy for bowel movements, but we use them in their natural states. So rather than adding the olive oil to your food, use the oil in the olives, eat the olives. If you don't like olives, there's sesame seeds, there's flax seeds, there's nuts. Mm. Now, if you still have a problem, if you've done all that and you still have a problem, here's some additional interventions you can do. All right, um, I'm going to go through this quickly. Exclude any infections like bacteria, fungal, parasitic that can cause constipation. There is small intestinal bowel overgrowth, which can cause chronic constipation. Double your fiber intake. Um, so, um, increase your legumes, such as kindies, navy beans, pintos, lima beans. Have vegetable, Brussels sprouts cauliflower, all those different things. Avoid things like corn and man-made um, vegan foods. Um, reduce the amount of laxatives you're using and try and replace it with psyllium husks. You can, you can buy these online, buy, buy Whole Foods online. And I haven't got shares in this company either. They add bulk and water to your stools, which allow for easy passage. Now, if you take psyllium husks, it's important that you drink even more water because psyllium husks absorbs the water into the stools. And it's important to build up gradually as well. You can also try chia seeds. Chia seeds, flax seeds and hemp seeds. These are so soluble fibers. These all add these can all be used in the same way as psyllium seeds. Um, another thing you can do is review your medications. If you're taking iron supplements, see if you can replace it with something else as well. If you're on painkillers, see if you can replace it with something else. If you're on omeprazole, look at replacing that as well. You can take vitamin C, um, which can help to soften the stools, and you take it to bowel tolerance. And also avoid stress, depression, and anxiety. So if you've done all that, you still have problems, you can think, uh, think of taking uh, magnesium um, sulfate. That's, that's really good. But again, it needs to be done under supervision, especially if you've never used it before. You can take aloe vera. I don't like the stuff, but it's excellent for constipation. Um, you can increase the amount of dry fruits in your diet. Again, drink a plenty of water because they're dehydrated. They need water as well. You can buy yourself an enema bag, follow the instructions on the bag, and you can give yourself an enema as well. There's different ways that you can give yourself enemas.
And then finally, another thing that you can do, if you've done all that and you still have a problem, you can seek some additional interventions. You can have a clonic hydrotherapy program, which we offer at Manor House. So finally, in summary, remember the old adage, prevention is better than cure. We need to be following the lifestyle that was originally prescribed for us. The original lifestyle was eating a whole food plant-based diet, drinking water and gentle, pleasant exercise after our meals. We need to develop habits of regularity of waking and sleeping, working and going to toilet. And most of all, have complete trust and gratitude in a God that loves us. So thank you very much.